Derek Chester Brown. Wonderful man, wonderful father. I keep forgetting that, right. that this guy actually has children. <laughs> Two lovely daughters. And he's what beautiful wife over here, Heidi. Let's give them a round of applause from Secunda and lead a church there called Lighthouse. And God is doing wonderful things in and through him. And we love you, Derek. Thank you for being friendly. Thank you for being a nice uh, Christian. And, but uh, be whatever God wants you to be today. <laughs> Thank you, Father. Right now, I once again just trust you for your great word to come powerfully through him for us. We want to be equipped, put whatever we need in our belts, Lord, in our hearts, on our feet and in our arms and in our hands for the sake of your kingdom. Let it come now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Bless you, Derek. Thank you, bud. Uh, good evening. All right, you've come all the way here on a Tuesday evening. So... It would be a bit pointless if you just sat there. Uh, so if I say something that you find slightly interesting, it's nice for me when you, you don't say amen. <laughs> but what do we say when I say something that you find pleasant? <laughs> Flip, that's good. Flip, that's good. Develop that habit because I grew up in a home where my mom would be sitting at a, a wayless meeting and a lady would say something and my mom would go, mm, amen. I'm like, jeez, man. So just don't be that weirdo. Uh, it's, yeah. Let me make the statement. Then you can go, well, that doesn't make sense. You can go read your Bibles. Um, God wants to fill the room with his presence before he touches you. Acts 2. He wants to fill the room. It says it came like a sound, like a mighty rushing wind. And he fills the room. That's why the devil's attacking church. That's why the institutions are against church. Because he doesn't, the, the enemy doesn't want the church filled with his presence. Because the, the Lord wants to fill the buildings. We keep on saying these things. Well, brother, you know, you're not the church. And the church is not the building. You know, it's all of us. Oh, shut up. Just shut up. He wants to see us in unity. He wants to fill this place. Because, you know, we, we're so petrified of, you know, embracing something of a, a culture of this matters. We just want to be libtards. And then instead of embracing that, we've got to get together. So that in this room, there's something. I walked in here this evening. Worship team is obviously busy doing an amazing job like they did now. And I walked in. But it's nice to be here. It's, it, it's, it, it's, you know, people say, it's got a nice vibe. That's what the unsaved people say when they, when they don't know to say, oh my gosh, the Holy Spirit's here. They go, it has a nice vibe. You, we, the nice vibe is what God wants to do so that He can fill the building, then anoint us to go and get all the guys that are outside there, inside, and get them born again. That's not even my sermon. This is going to be fun. So I'm trusting that He's going to fill this room. And it says that they were in unity all in one accord. It was a prayer meeting. So if you don't, have, if you don't attend prayer meetings, don't expect the Holy Spirit to use you too much. Um, all seven that attended this week's prayer meeting just agreed with me. The rest of you, the rest of you quickly processed, but you know, I was busy. Yeah. It's okay. There were 380 other people that had seen the risen king um, in that time and never attended a prayer meeting. So we're allowed to have those moments. But I don't see any evidence in Scripture where tongues divided and fire touched the people that didn't attend the prayer meeting. So that's just a... You, you guys do have a prayer meeting, eh? You do. You start one. Attend it. I wanted to say something. I mentioned it to the seven people that were praying with us outside. Um, This is extraordinary. This is a Tuesday night during a time when churches are battling to get anybody to attend. Um, I want to honor you. I want to honor this eldership team. You guys are doing well. This is a good church. This is a good church. This is a good church. We, I want to honor you, Brad, Teresa. You guys, you're doing well. I watch you guys on Facebook, and you guys are doing well. Uh, you know, it's, and I judge you. <laughs> Obviously. Why? 
And I'm watching, and you guys are doing so well. And on a Tuesday night, you come out and, 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 and attend this thing. You must be expecting something quite extraordinary. Because there'd be something deeply wrong with you. If you've come all this way on a Tuesday night and not going, well, I'm going to get something. You're starting with me tonight. I can sense that. But it's okay. I get it. Um, I want to honor Kia, Kelly, Zach, and Ilana. I, if you guys don't know who they are, you will. Uh, I remember years ago sitting at conferences with Kia preaching. And uh, it would be such an honor. I'd make sure I get to those sessions and I'd go and listen to Kia. And I've told this to Kia, so I'm not going to embarrass him more. Um, it, it's, I'd sit there and I'd try to take notes. And if you've listened to Kia, you start for the first three minutes. <laughs> Speak to me, Lord. That's what happens, right? I, I, I reckon that's, a, that's the John the Baptist, Jesus anointing. I don't think people were preoccupied with their notebooks when Jesus was going for it. Because he had short sermons. We turned them into long and boring ones, but he had short, punchy ones. And Because, uh, I mean, I've heard people butcher the Sermon on the Mount. It's just horrific. If you cannot stand up, read the Sermon on the Mount verbatim. You don't have an anointing, because that's all Jesus said. So we somehow feel we have to unpack it. But back to here. I'd go and I'd, I'd listen to him teaching. And I'd remember things and the testimonies and the story. It's an honor to share a stage with you, Kay. It really is. It, it's a privilege. So, you know, it's, I'm, I'm big on honor because I honor what I want God to bless in my life. So if I want God to bless my ministry, I honor those that I respect in ministry. If you're the kind of person that you feel quite free to speak about your leaders, don't be in leadership. If you feel free to speak about those ministering, you'll never be in ministry. If your attitude is, well, you know, if I led a church, you don't. Shut up. <laughs> it's like those people without children, best parenting advice. Yeah. Uh, if I had children, I wouldn't let them do that. Then one day they breed, and all of a sudden they manifest 24-7. <laughs> so when you go and do it, show us how well you can do it. Uh, if I was an elder, maybe that's why you aren't an elder yet. <laughs> because there's stuff wrong. When you learn to honor people, then God can bless you. Zach. Have a great one. <laughs> one thing I can say about Zach. Um, you, you have the ability to change conference direction with prophetic words. I remember at so many uh, LTTs, I only got saved after LTT stopped. And uh, that's how recently I saved. But we'd have when the equip started, and you could see the flow of a conference running in a certain way. He gets up, shares a profound word, and you'd watch the direction change. They would, things would change. You're one of the guys, when you speak, I listen. Very few people have my attention like that. I want to honor you this evening. Your teaching on the prophetic, it's incredible, uh, it's enviable. Guys, it's, it's a pr I, I want you to understand what I'm doing now. What you honor, God can bless. Kind of like your finances. You're so busy hanging on to that 10%, God can't bless the 90. You guys are all saved, hey? Yeah. Those who are, are excited. Those who aren't, don't know the difference. Um... Zach and I are running in tandem. Brad, your words were to me. Soften him. <laughs> Marinate him so he can roast them. <laughs> so you'll come with the fire. Um, can I ask you to do me a, a, just a quick favor? Um, it's, it's not weird. And if you think it's weird and you're too good for this kind of stuff, then don't do it. Um, but if you, if you love Jesus, you will. If you wouldn't mind, and I want you to bear with me, and don't make it all holy, what I'm going to ask you to do, because now you're in church and suddenly it has to be an angel speaking to you, and it's just it's weird. 
I want to ask you to do this exercise with me really quickly. Um, if you wouldn't mind, if you would just relax in your chair. This is not hypnosis, it's not weird, trust me, please. You're thinking of your bank account now. <laughs> if you sit in your chair comfortably and just with your eyes closed, if you could close your eyes, I'd like to do this with you. I'm, I'm trusting that God is going to work right now. So while your eyes are closed, I want you to think about, probably, think about where you would sit if you were reading the Bible. Somewhere comfortable at your home, on your chair, that you'd always sit. There's music playing in the background. It's, it's really a happy, happy time. You, you're comfortably sitting on your chair, like you're sitting now, but you're at home. You're at the spot where you trust every morning to meet with the king. Perhaps you don't do that, so quickly think of a place in your house that's comfortable and how you're sitting there. So now you're sitting there, and I want you to... You're sitting in that spot that you are in right now. And all of a sudden, you, you don't see his face, but you realize Jesus has just walked into the room. You don't look up at him. You're sitting there, and you can sense he's just walked into the room. His physical presence is in the room right now with you. The God of all, Jesus Christ, walks in. I want you, he walks up to you, and he's going to give you a box. Beautiful box. Doesn't matter what size it is, that's up to you. Doesn't matter what shape, he's going to give you a box. You sense his pleasure over you. He's happy that he's with you. He walks up to you. I want you to put your hand out, and then you want, you take the box from him and you bring it, you receive it into your lap. He steps back. And I want you to want you, you open the box. You open the box and you look inside. What is it this evening that he's giving you? What is it this evening that he's giving to you? This evening, in this moment, that he's giving to you? Perhaps it's something that you've been trusting for. Perhaps you have no idea what it is. Lord, we thank you that this evening we have received already, you're depositing already, you're placing in our hearts already, in our minds, in our beings, what it is that you want to see released into our destinies. We receive what you have for us for the sake of your kingdom, for the sake of your people, for the sake of this church. We receive what you've given us in Jesus' name. Amen. Would anybody like to share what they got? I do this exercise with my family ever so often. Very seldom, but I do this. So the last time, and I'll share with you, because maybe you got something weird, but you want to come up and go, no, Jesus gave me an emerald with rubies, and there was a cross on there, and there was a little fountain of blood. Whatever. That's cool. That's cool. Go watch a Star Wars or something for creativity. So I open this box, and I'm, for me, it is etched in my mind, this beautiful white and red box, and I get it, and I open it up, and there's this beautiful dice. You know the die that you gamble with? You don't know. You guys know that you gamble with. A nice six-sided die. And I, I, and I feel God say, there. And I had been asking God the whole week, Lord, I want to know with strategic accuracy what I need to do next in the life of the church. And he gives me a dice and he says, yeah, go with it. I'm like, this is a one out of six chance of winning. This is a, a five out of six of getting it wrong. And I took it out. In my mind, I take it out. And all six sides have got a six on. And I felt God say, it doesn't matter how you roll with me, you're going to win. That's a cool one. That's a cool one. That's a, that's a risk dice. So we're going to hit the casinos. <laughs> you know, it's that simple little thing. I mean, it's a silly exercise. It can be a profound exercise when you sit. I expect to meet with my king every morning. I, I chat to him. He talks back to me. He tells me stuff I don't like to hear. I tell him stuff I don't like to do. And we chat about it. We negotiate. I hold my sin ransom. And he, he tells me what it's going to cost me. And he works with me. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a ton of work. So it takes me a little bit longer with him. Sometimes in the morning, it's literally, Jesus, I need you. He goes, I know. I'll chat later. Here we go. We get it. I have a good relationship with him. So, you know, you have to have a shocking relationship with your wife. If date night has to be, hi, my name's Derek. Hi, hi, hi Heidi. Uh, have a seat. Sorry, where do you? That's it. Then you have no relationship with your wife. It should be, sweetie, what you're having. Yeah, okay. That's a relationship. Um, and we have the perfect marriage. Who would like to be brave enough to share? Behave, behave. 
Who'd like to be brave enough to share what they saw in their mind when I spoke about God giving them this box? Quickly, come and share. So who'd like to share? Can we risk it? Can we risk it? Do you have a mic? I don't want to give anybody a mic and Brad's going, anyone but that guy. But guys, can we keep it to 30 seconds? I don't want to hear your breakdown on scripture. <laughs> Quick, just... Evening, people. Um, just to keep it brief, I didn't expect this when I closed my eyes. But I received a purified heart from Jesus. Nice. So I'm sitting on a rock, um, Araby Gorge, looking over the gorge, reading my Bible. Jesus pitches up on the right hand side, hands me a wooden box, and walks away. I open it up, and it's communion, wine, bread, crackers, and the little cups. What more do you need? What more do you actually need? He's telling me about his blood and his body. Very good. Uh, has anybody got a weird one? I got no, a, no, I'm looking I got for a, the weird one. I've got a ball of light. Ball of light? Yeah. Okay. Who, who else got a ball of light? Oh, yeah. Okay. Come on. Okay, well, let's ask the question then. Ask them. Who's got... I just, another one. What did that mean to you when you got chuckles? Yeah. Next season's going to be sweet. I like that. So approach it with joy. Where's Pierre? God wants to give you fire, you receive it, you hang on to it, you cultivate it. Make this a habit in the morning. Jesus, what have you got for me? Make it a habit. And you're, you're going to get some weird stuff and it's cool and share it with your family. Get your family to do it. Simple exercise. What do all three of you get? Yeah. A letter? Oh, that's good. Which what one? A, B, C, or D? <laughs> a letter. That's beautiful. Beautiful. Tithe. Come on. Oh, wow. yeah. I've just lost the meeting. Charlene? Yeah, sorry, bro. And inside was a deeper relationship with God. Beautiful, eh? That's lovely. Ben, oh. what did you get? Wow. Hope. Hope, eh? It's lovely. Very good. Well done. It's lovely, guys. So, let me, that's my intro. Let's get started. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that every person this evening that is willing to go and do whatever we share on will hear what I have to say. Lord, I pray every person sitting here that is not a doer of your word, but just a hearer, that you'll work on their heart, that that'll change. That we will not be people sitting to have our ears tickled or to be entertained or to get fat. But Lord, you'll feed us and provoke us and you'll stir us. That will be a hunger and a passion for you. Lord, we pray that every single person and family represented in this room will go out and do and be what you challenge and call them to be in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me read a scripture to you. It's in Isaiah 49 verse 8. This says the Lord. In the time of favor, I've answered you. In the day of salvation, I've helped you. I'll keep you and give you as a covenant to the people to establish the land, to apportion the desolate heritages. The last word, the desolate heritages. Desolate inheritance. A desolate inheritance is an inheritance that has been laid down by someone else and has not fulfilled what God had given them. So it's like getting this inheritance for someone. So... Someone passes away and you, you're, the treasure is left in there for you. And you go and you get this treasure and you, you take it. And instead of going and spending everything in there, you put it down and you walk away. God's saying, I want to hand out in the time of favor. This is the season we're in. We're in a time of favor. I want to take all the desolate inheritances. There are inheritances that are lying around in the four ways area of people that were in ministry and they've walked away. 
They've abandoned the faith. They've abandoned the call. They've abandoned their ministry. They've laid down. It's a desolate inheritance. And God doesn't throw that away. He says, who wants to pick up that mantle? You see, we all go, well, you know, Billy Graham passes on. We go, Lord, I'll carry that mantle. But you don't have the ability. You, don't have, you haven't developed yet. You don't have the character. You don't have the anointing to carry that mantle. Why not trust God that there's an inheritance and a desolate one that's been left? There's your own. There's something that he's apportioned you, and it's incredible. And he's saying, yes, but I want to give you more, because there's stuff that's been left abandoned by other people. There are pastors that have sinned and stepped out of ministry. There are church leaders that have gone and run off, and they've left churches. And I'm not talking just about people. There's an inheritance, a legacy, a heritage that they've left behind. And God says, he says, I want to give you those so that you can run with that, because too many people have quit. I believe the incredible ministers of the word, powerful ministers of the word, that should have stayed in the country, but they've ducked. They're going, they're living down south somewhere, they're in some country where it's just too easy. And now their countries are also getting difficult. I want to go to greener pastures, that just didn't expect all the manure, because that's why the pasture was greener. I want the land of milk and honey, I just don't want the bees and cow poop. They've left, and they've left an inheritance that was given to them. And it hasn't been, we have a nation that needs to be born again. And every time a Christian leaves, God's going, who's going to do their portion? Who's going to do their portion? Please don't be the Christian that runs away because there's a portion for you to get done. It's the people that God's called you to minister to. And it's this incredible heritage for you. We want to leave legacy. There's an inheritance really waiting for us. I believe in this area. You know, and I'll say this wherever I go, but I believe this area is just ripe for the picking. It's God's put you here as a lampstand. It's a, it's a, a reference to the, the, the light of God that He's placed here so that you can burn. But there, there's some of you that God is going to set up. You know, the way I used to admire the gentleman that I spoke about earlier, there, there's some of you that one day will get up on a platform and preach. You need to start getting ready. Don't, don't, don't desire the platform. Desire the one that will give you profile. And it's not the leaders, it's the king. And then you desire to get to know His Word. And you go, well, I'm not able... That's fine, you don't have to be, but get equipped. You know, we often say, well, God doesn't call the equipped, the, you know, equips the, uh, you know, he doesn't call the, uh, you know, he doesn't call the able, no, he doesn't call the able, he equips those that he calls. How's about getting equipped so God actually says, okay, go for it? Because you know what? I don't think David was God's first choice. I don't think God, he was God's first choice. God never wanted there to be a king. But he was a worshiper. He learned how to look after sheep. He wasn't offended by the small things. He was getting the job done while these other seven brothers were hanging around the house. And God said, no, no, out of this, something's going to come that's going to be incredible. Get ready. Get ready. I remember when I just got born again. I'd say, well, I'm going to travel and I'm going to go and evangelize. And my mom would say to me, old lady, wise, do you have a passport? No. I'd rather pray for wisdom before you pray for ministry. Just an idea. So there is a legacy that you're going to leave based on the inheritance that you're willing to pick up. Now, you don't have to. You don't have to. It's fine. But come on, you've come out on a Tuesday evening. You must be hungry for something. So I want to chat this evening. The other guys, they're going to do well at everything they do. They're going to cover healing and the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to touch on that and a bit on authority. But I want to speak a little bit about, well, let's look. Luke chapter 4, verse 31. And he went down to Capernaum, a city in Galilee. This is Jesus, and he was teaching on the Sabbath. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he, his word possessed authority. And in the synagogue, there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down in their midst, he came out of him, having done him no harm. They were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits. They come out, and reports about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. That is revival. It was not the power of the preach. It was not the epic sound the worship team generated. Worship team, love. My family's all worshippers. I've got this voice. So I don't sing. 
it wasn't his teaching. It was the demonstration of power over the forces of darkness that got the whole area going, we want that. Do you, are you comfortable with the Lord's Prayer? Are you comfortable with the Lord's Prayer? Our Father in art in, our, who art in heaven is just wonderful. Hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Beautiful. On earth as it is in heaven, praise Jesus. Give us this day our daily bread. Thank you, Lord, that we don't have to bant. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the e- deliver us from the evil one. Christians live under this fog of stupidity, excuse me, of ignorance, where we go, well, if you're a Christian, you can't have a demon. If the one who calls him father has to pray for deliverance, then we are living under an understanding that is sabotaging Christians on a daily basis from walking not only in freedom, but in power. We... <laughs> We, uh, we were on a farm recently, and they were doing fire breaks. I, I don't mind a felt fire smell. It's quite cool. It's my camping smell. But we get there, and there's a stench of death in the farmlands. And it hangs for two days. And as I look out on the field, there are these, there are these cow pies. You know cow pie. I'm not talking about a beef pie. Like big cow poops in the field. And as they burnt the field, these things are just smoldering and smoking and just oozing. It burnt twice as long as anything else. The stench of that place. You see, we all want to be set on fire, but we don't want to deal with the poop in our lives. Then we become offensive to those around us. This evening, I want to deal with a little bit of that. You know, I love it in... In Revelation chapter 2, verse 3, Jesus speaks to the church in Ephesus. He says, I know you're enduring patiently, bearing up for my name's sake. It's kind of the, the modern day church after 2020. You have not grown weary. Well done. But I have this against you. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Oh, it must be faith. Because that's how we read the scripture. You've abandoned your first love. It carries on. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent. And how do we repent? You do the works that you did at first. If not, I'll come and remove your lampstand. So Jesus says to John, well, in, as he reveals this to John, to the church at Ephesus, guys, you've lost your first love. You know why you've lost your first love? I can see it. Because you no longer do what you used to do. What you did, you should start doing again. Because that's how you show the first love you had. And that's why you're going to have power. And that's what your endurance will bring you. Yeah. So we go, Lord, we don't want to abandon our first love. But I read that and I go, okay, so what is the Ephesians first love? If he's writing this letter to the church in Ephesus, there's got to be something that the church in Ephesus did. So I want to read a bit about the Ephesian church to you. Acts 19. This church is wild. God is doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. This is what was happening in Ephesus, that Jesus is saying, do this stuff. Yeah, but you know, that's more for the, that's more for the, 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 the old church. You know, modern church, we don't do that. No, dead churches don't do that. Living churches do. <laughs> then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists, sorry, I missed the whole verse, and the diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. You see, this is a big thing. We all want to have healing meetings. Person comes, what's wrong? <laughs> have you got a cough? Yeah. <laughs> have you got taste? No. <laughs> Look, have your protocols, wear your masks. Most Christians have been doing it for years in the church anyway. <laughs> do what you do. Come, sanitize. Um, you might want to take this out, because honestly, if hand sanitizer and masks cure COVID, then we shouldn't have it. Anyway. But I'm telling you, we need to go and find those with COVID, pack the freaking churches and see them healed. Because that will get the attention that we need. But at the moment, the government looks at us and goes, no, no, you guys are just the ones that want to hide from the tax man. You want to collect money and do stuff that's not cool and you just want to have illegal. We need to be the powerhouses of the world. This needs to be where they go, oh, my life's screwed. I need to get to church. I don't know what. That's what happened when my life was a mess. I just said to Jesus, when, well, I just said to Heidi when Jesus spoke to me. I get them confused sometimes. She's quite good. Uh, I need to, when I met with Jesus, I, need, I said to her, I need to go to church. She said, which one? I said, I don't care. 
I don't care. We worry about our programs. We worry about our setups. Are the chairs neat? Are the chairs... When the desperate are looking for Jesus, it doesn't matter. I staggered into that church. I can't remember what they preached. They made an altar call. They could have read a cake recipe. I got up. I said, I'm going to give my life to Jesus. It doesn't bother me anymore. The reality is when there's power in the house, the people will be attracted. But if you're going to constantly live in a state of fear, flip. This flipping tablet of mine keeps telling me, are you in distress? Do you need help? And some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the, invoke the name of the Lord under those who had evil spirits. So the fake leaders go and use the name of Jesus to do business against the demonic. So seven sons of the Jewish high priest named Siva were doing this. <laughs> they say to the demons, I adjure you by the, by the Jesus who Paul proclaims. The, devil, the demons answered them this, Jesus I know. And Paul, I recognize, who are you? you? You think you've got power because you know the name of Jesus. You, you need to know that you start operating power when the demons know your name. But you're not in the fight yet, so they don't know you yet. <laughs> And then the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them. That means he kicked the ass. <laughs> so that they fled the house naked and wounded. Bedtime story stuff for kids. <laughs> and this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon all of them. And the name of Jesus was extolled. We don't operate. If you've got a headache, you come to the front. I, we do it as well. I'm, please, I'm not knocking. I am, sorry. They come to the front for a headache. Be healed in Jesus' name. Do you feel better? Mm -mm. Well, God is sovereign. Go back to your seat. Well, if he's sovereign, what the hell did you call me to the front of the church for? So you could lay hands on me. Oh, well, God heals in his own time. Then tell me that. Don't make me come to the front for prayer. Either heal me or leave me. Well, I'm trying my best. No, no, you're trying to function in a realm that you're not familiar with. Come to my healing teaching. That's different. But when last did we stand in church? Every one of you with a demon, line up. Because then every woman looks at her husband. <laughs> All the husbands look at, look at their mother-in-laws. <laughs> when last did we have the kind of meeting or the kind of power where the demons manifest in meetings? 55 times it happens with Jesus. Where somebody that's demon-possessed runs at him and goes, we want freedom. What do we do? I need freedom. Okay, I can set you up six weeks of counseling. Can you meet with me on Mondays? I've got a gap between 10 and 11. Um, if you sit with me, we can talk about it. And uh, I'll try not to offend your sexuality while trying to figure out what gender you are. Trying to figure out what you're called to be without offending you. We're so petrified of the enemy we entertain them. We take them for drinks and think we're going to see breakthrough. If I offended you, please come and take me on at the end of the meeting. We need to step into the place that Jesus referenced and go, go do that, that will show you. The love that you have for me. Go and do what you started doing. Signs, wonders, miracles. I love, I mean, we, we love worship in our church. It's all about Him. I, I love good preaching. But I love driving demons out of people. Because most of the time, we get so caught up into being polite to the person, we polite to the demon. We have made deliverance a Hollywood fantasy thing. Like you need deliverance. Next minute you're on your back crawling up the walls, hanging from the ceiling, shooting something. I don't know. 
as opposed to deliverance being a daily thing that I walk in. Now, if you want to stay, if you want to, I'll, I'll teach you this evening how to do deliverance. I'll do it really quickly. You know, you've got to get silver bullets, garlic, and holy water. You've got to understand the intricate details of how the demons work. Actually, no. I'll touch on it tomorrow night, but you've got to understand your authority. But you know, there's something about when you're born again that you have the identity of Christ. When you have the identity of Christ and you take on the demonic. I've done it on numerous occasions because we got known as the church, the Dutch Reformed Church, you know, the Spark Plug Church, NGK. They will get hold of us when there's a problem. We will go and do the work. And we get there. The demon will sit up. And we've had young girls, they sit up in this voice go, what do you want? I'll go, I'm here with an eviction notice. You're going to leave. Everyone else is standing there praying in tongues. I love it when they do that. The demon doesn't have a flipping clue what you're saying. You want to speak to the hell in a heavenly language. That's like going to Germany speaking Chinese and somehow wondering why they're not leaving. You'll have more, you'll have more success telling the thing to foot sack. They understand that. I've told demons in Brazil to foot sack. They understand. It must be the dog demon from South Africa. I don't know. Until you start walking with the understanding that we call to set demons to tell them to duck and to leave, our families will never walk in the freedom that they're called to. We're happy to pray for healings because you know what happens when people don't get healed? Oh, well, go see the doctor. The problem is when we're not seeing our families being set free from generational curses, from bloodline curses, from soul ties that have happened because you've screwed around too much. Well, I don't believe in that. I don't care. Do you wonder why you're not having breakthrough? You wonder why life's a mess? Do you wonder why you're going through these recurring, challenging relationships? I don't know. I just have bad luck. No, you've got demons. And you've opened doors. You've opened the doors. You've opened the booze cabinet. You've said, come have a party in my life. And then you go, oh, well, they're making too much noise. So you close the door and you just suppress them. But at night, you're having nightmares. You're petrified. You're terrified of everything. You suffer from anxiety. You suffer from depression. You suffer from fear that's actually paralyzing you because you're worried about the country. You're worried about your job. You're worried about things you don't even know about yet. God has not given me a spirit of fear. If you feel that you've been stripped of power, love, and a sound mind, it's because you're entertaining the spirit of fear. But as long as he behaves and he sits really quietly in the corner and he doesn't disrupt my day and if I can just make it through the day and get home, what I'll do is I'll, I'll blame bad medication, I'll blame the TV or maybe it's my diet. I'll stop eating cheese. <laughs> we'll look for answers in everything because we've made a deliverance ministry a second-rate backdoor garage ministry as opposed to it being the most important. When you get born again, come, let's get those bugs out of you. You've fallen into sin, let's get that demon of lust out of you. Now, I've got a problem with porn. Switch your computer off. One guy said to me, I'm battling to stop smoking. I said, you know how you stop smoking? No. I said, come here, I'll tell you. Stop buying. Huh? Stop buying cigarettes. No, but the craving, oh, do you want me to see you set free from the spirit of addiction? No, 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 I just crave something. I'm not talking about craving a chocolate on a Sunday night because you've had a long day. Brad, I get it. I get it. I'm talking about seeing your family set free. I'm talking about walking in freedom. You know where there's some people that you meet and you think, I just, there's a clash. It's possibly the demons in them and the Holy Spirit in you or vice versa. We don't know who I'm talking to here. But until we get to a point where we can say, I'm actually comfortable with deliverance. I want to be set free. I want to walk in freedom. Because Jesus came to set the captives free. As, so we're walking around with mobile prisons. I don't care how much you're going to be desperate for a healing ministry. You won't walk in it because you're not walking in freedom yourself. You want a prophetic ministry? You need to have your ears unblocked. You need to have your ears open to what the king is saying. Then you can walk in that. Then you say deliverance ministry. You're like, I've got to wear a trench coat now. I don't have to beard. I didn't even grow a full beard. And let me tell you, this is how you're going to do it. I'm going to run through it really quickly because we need to get some other good preaching up here as well. Bear with me. I do mass deliverance while I'm preaching sometimes. And it's not such a little, demons leave. 
This is how you do deliverance. You affirm your faith in Christ Jesus. Because you cannot do deliverance on somebody that's not born again. Because what the word says is if the demons leave and the house isn't refilled, the demons come back with seven more. So I'm very careful. I don't do deliverance when I do ministry in certain areas where they're witch doctors. Because witch doctors come for deliverance so they can get more powerful. They believe in it more than you do. <laughs> you affirm your faith in Christ Jesus and you affirm... You speak, I confess with my mouth that Jesus isn't just Lord, He's my Lord. Not just Savior. He's not my get out of hell free card. He's the one that got me out of hell so that I can submit to Him. Then I say, thank you, Lord God, that you have forgiven me. But Lord, I'm going to forgive those that have hurt me. And you start and you say, Holy Spirit, remind me, of the, remind me who has offended me. Now you might think, I don't need reminding who has offended me. Yes, you do. Because you'll suddenly have the most random name pop into your mind that hurt you when you were 12. You go, no, it can't be. Well, it's not the devil reminding you. It's him. So, and you start forgiving people. And you forgive your parents. You go, I had wonderful parents. Trust me. We have this natural built-in rebellion that we want to rebel against our parents. And then they are sometimes nasty to us. I had amazing parents. When I've done deliverance on myself, when I sat one day, I said, Lord, I need to be free. I don't want to run with baggage. He said to me, forgive them. I said, for what? I was molested as a child. It wasn't my parents' fault. I said, I, I don't hold that against them at all. He said, there's a little bit that does. Oh, Lord, that isn't... <laughs> what? <laughs> I'm sitting in my room going, what the... <laughs> and that, phew, where did that come from? So, Lord, thank you that I'm yours. And then... I forgive those that have hurt me. Lord, I ask that you forgive me for my sins, but also where I've hurt others. If you've had multiple relationships where you've hurt people, ask for forgiveness. Don't contact them. Don't open up those wounds. I'll say, Jesus, I pray, bring healing to their lives. Jesus only came for one thing, for people. You can't hurt them. Ask for forgiveness. And then you start addressing things. You say, Lord, I don't know what's in my bloodline. So my bloodline, my ancestors on the one side, my grandfather was a warlock and my grandmother was a witch. She was the head of the Joburg Coven, practicing witch. On my other side, fortune teller gypsy um, and um, some Scottish druids. Really pure bloodline. <laughs> all the demonic is in that. All that is, it's spiritual gifting operating in the shadows. So I go, Lord, I speak a blessing over my bloodline. I redeem my bloodline. None of that has an impact on me. But Lord, every gift that you've placed in my bloodline, I receive and I'll operate in your power for the rest of my days. Lord, I break every vow, every covenant, every inner vow, every word I've spoken against myself, I break off. Because we say things like, oh, I'm so sick and tired. I'm so sick and tired. I'm... And then all of a sudden you notice how much more sick and tired you actually are. Because life and death is in the power of the tongue. Lord, I speak against every word that I've spoken over myself, that other people have spoken over me, inner vows, even inner covenants, promises that I've made that I've broken that's been ungodly. I break that off in the name of Jesus. And then any demonic force, every evil spirit that is coming to try to torment me, direct me, possess me, or try and lead me, leave me in Jesus' name. You untwist, untangle, unwind, and you leave to never return. Some of you are feeling uncomfortable now. He's doing something. I rebuke every spirit of Absalom, Jezebel, Leviathan. I rebuke Sanballat, Geshem, Tobiah. In Jesus' name. I don't know them. It's fine. I do. I've seen them in Scripture. And if they've named them in Scripture, I'll call them by name. That makes me feel uncomfortable. It's all right. I'm allowed to make you feel uncomfortable because the Holy Spirit's the comforter. I'm not. And then I close every door that I've opened accidentally, intentionally. I close every door my parents have opened over my life. I close everything. I reject ancestral worship. I reject covenants made by my parents over me. I reject blood sacrifices that have been made in honor of whatever God. Even if it may be in your name, Jesus. I break that off. And every devil be warned. I'm free. And then you pray this, Holy Spirit, fill me into every recess of my life. Help me close those doors. Help me shut those avenues because I want to walk free. I want to live free. Friends, when you're free, 
the fire can come and it's powerful. And your family will walk in freedom. And you will walk in freedom. And then you will walk in power. You cannot partner with power and partner with darkness and expect to have an outcome that is pleasant on any level. Let me pray with you quickly. Jesus, you're good. You're good. You're kind. You're unreasonably kind. I pray, Lord, that you'll lead us and direct us and guide us. Lord, I pray for every person over here. Equip us and stir us, Lord, even as we get into these sessions. Lord, I rebuke any spirit that is trying to hinder uh, understanding, any spirit that is trying to close ears. We just speak of freedom in this room. We speak of freedom over the children of God. No longer will you be oppressed. I speak, I speak life over every single person that's suffering from depression. It has a name. It has to bow to the name of Jesus. The rest of you guys, I'll get to you later. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I love this. Uh, Jesus to Paul. Paul says, who are you, Lord? He's, he's the first time he meets Jesus, and he knows he's the Lord. <laughs> he says, who are you, Lord? He's like, I'm not going to mess with you. The Lord rep- replies, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Isn't that awesome? The minute somebody persecutes someone who belongs to Jesus, Jesus takes it seriously. If you've ever been persecuted, Jesus takes it personally. I am Jesus, the one you're persecuting, but get up and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness of what you've seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your people and from the Gentiles, and I'm sending you to them to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a share among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Isn't that wonderful? You and I have been called to know Jesus, to know that Jesus protects us and loves us, and that Jesus wants to use us as witnesses to set people free from the power of darkness to the power of God. There are a lot of people stuck in darkness, folk. There are a lot of people stuck in darkness. How about we allow the light of God to break in on us so powerfully? Tonight, as you go home, pray these prayers again. I think there were 10 points that you gave there, Derek. I'll get them to you. If you're on the church mailbox, if you're not on the church mailbox, get on there tonight because I'll send these notes. And you pray through these things because you don't need another day. (laughs) I remember when when, uh, Moses says to Pharaoh, um, should I ask God to remove all the frogs? Because there was a curse of frogs across the land. So Pharaoh says, tomorrow. So Moses is like, okay, you can have another night with the frogs. (laughs) You you don't need another night with the frogs. Please, in Jesus' name. It's time to flush them out, get set free, and then begin to set others free.